Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we are here tonight with Carl Watner, the author of The Essential Voluntarius. Well, he's the, he published and edited uh, the Voluntarius newsletter since uh, 1982, and we're here celebrating the release for Liberty Me members of The Essential Voluntarius, which is a, a fabulous collection of essays. Now, Carl is an author, a, uh, a historian of libertarian studies, and a voluntarist himself. He's written for Reason Magazine, Libertarian Forum, and the, Journey, the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And one of my favorite things uh, about Carl is that he has, uh, he found the Vices Are Not Crimes essay by Lysander Spooner. Apparently, I've, that's one of my favorite essays, and I'm so glad he brought it to light. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carl Wattner. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight, Matt. Thanks for your introduction. I'm grateful to the management and sponsors of Liberty Me for publishing this ebook and for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. I'm grateful to Wendy McElroy uh, for being the editor of this anthology of my articles. I'm grateful to my wife and family for their support. I'm also uh, thankful to Greg, who is the webmaster of a voluntary site for all the work that he does uh, things up on the floor. And as an aside, I just like to mention that most of the articles that I mentioned in the office, besides being in the ebook, there'll be some I mentioned that aren't in the ebook, can be found on the voluntary site, www.voluntarius.com. And if anybody wishes to communicate with me, they can use the contact uh, us phone on the voluntary site to reach me. Briefly, briefly tonight, I'd like to talk, uh, organize my talk into four sections. Uh, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the personal events in my own life uh, that led to the formation of the voluntarists. And then, in uh, preparation for my talk tonight, I prepared a nine point, short nine point discussion about what voluntarism means to me. That's kind of after we get into that and give you a basis for understanding my perspective on voluntarism. And then in the third part of my talk, I'd like to mention some of the highlights and most important articles, the articles that I find most uh, appealing to me in the ebook. And then uh, finally, I'd like to return to a little more in-depth talk of how I actually became a voluntarist. And then if we have some time at the end, uh, I'll be open for questions, do my best to answer them. So the background of the voluntarist per se actually began in uh, early 1982 in George Smith's apartment in Los Angeles, California. Uh, George Smith and Wendy McElroy and I had made uh, contact through some libertarian conferences earlier that year and in the preceding year. George was concerned that some of the free market uh, anarchists were getting involved in the Libertarian Party. And he saw that as being inconsistent with their advocacy of anarchism, of doing away with the state. George had already written a uh, lengthy article titled Party Dialogue, with a uh, conversation between a Libertarian Party supporter and a uh, anti-Libertarian or anti-electoral or voluntarist about the pros and cons of libertarians, libertarians involved in electoral politics. Uh, that particular article was published by Sam Konkin originally, and it can be found on the voluntary site today. So George and Wendy and I at the time, and over a, a few months' time, decided that we needed a, vo a vocal point to espouse new strategies 
and to present the oppositional ideas as to the uh, Libertarian Party. At that point, it was decided that a, a newsletter would be appropriate, be an appropriate form, and we published the first issue, as Matt said, of the Voluntarist in 1982. It was also about this same time that I made the acquaintance of Bob Lefebvre, and uh, he was very supportive of the idea behind the Voluntarist. And it was through Bob that I actually met my wife, uh, Julie, at Freedom School in South Carolina. George and Wendy and I cooperated in publishing the Voluntarist Noodles Letter for a number of years, but uh, eventually their interest in it uh, dwindled, and I continued on studying, researching, writing on Voluntarist newsletter. In a sense, used it as my personal form, as one of my outlets. In 2000, after I had completed uh, the first hundred issues of the newsletter, uh, Fox and Wilkes, a division of laissez-faire books, published the first anthology, the first voluntarist anthology, which is titled "I Must Speak Out." Uh, so that covered the first hundred issues. Uh, the new ebook uh, covers probably another 50 issues, and at the present time, I'm up to uh, issue 165, and hopefully still going strong. That gives you just a brief uh, introduction to the formation and the background of the voluntarists. For this talk, I prepared a short nine-point essay titled, What Voluntarism Means to Me. Now, I, I'm not sure that anybody has any special qualifications to divine voluntarism, but obviously my particular uh, qualifications would be that I am a longtime student of, of this topic and been publishing a newsletter both in historical tradition and in contemporary usage, voluntarism coincides with my personal philosophy of nonviolence and non-participation in politics. So with special thanks to all the voluntarists of the past who have contributed to this tradition, I offer the following statement of belief, and I'll listen by number. Uh, first, I condemn all invasive acts and reject the initiation of violence. This is what many today would call libertarianism. This is your basic libertarian philosophy. Two, I assert that the state acts aggressively when it engages in taxation and monop coercively monopolizes the provision of public services. Now, not all libertarians agree with that assertion, but those who do agree with it, that the state is acting aggressively in taxing, would generally label themselves as anarchists. What uh, I describe and what George Smith labeled the anarchist insight into the nature of the state, that insight being that the state is inherently and necessarily invasive, it's necessarily an invasive institution, serves to distinguish the anarchist from the run-of-the-mill libertarian. In other words, not all libertarians are anarchists, since some libertarians would view taxation and limited government as non-invasive and illegitimate. Four, I hold the doctrine, which is common among anarchists, that all the affairs of people should be based on, be conducted on a voluntary basis. I don't argue for the specific form that those voluntary arrangements would take, only that force be abandoned so that individuals in society may flourish. Five, therefore I consider the burden of proof to, to rest on those who attempt to justify the state in whatever form they should think it takes. Since they're trying to prevent peace, people from peacefully using their own property in accord with their desires. 
6. Although it's not incumbent upon them to do so, some anarchists try to present their vision of a future stateless society. Based on these visions, we can see that there are many different types of anarchists. The main issues that have separated anarchists historically and theoretically involve the issues of how property will be owned in a stateless society and what means will be used to remove the state from our lives. Seven. I am what you would label a individualist anarchist because I recognize the validity of the self-ownership and the homesteading axioms. The individualists advocate private ownership of property, both in personal consumption items as well as in the means of production. Other anarchists, which would label themselves collectivist, communist, communalist, syndicalist, support some type of community of communal or community ownership of the means of production. So we distinguish them from the individualist anarchist. Eight, like all, all voluntarists, past and present, I commit myself to shunning participation in the electoral system. And I also reject violent means of fighting or sabotaging the state. Violence is no substitute for a convincing argument. People must come voluntarily on their own to the conclusion that the state is not a necessary institution. Rejection of political means and violence is premised on the voluntarist insight that government depends on the cooperation of the people over whom it rules. A mid-16th century Frenchman, Etienne de la Boite, was probably the first to call attention to this observation. If enough people withdraw their cooperation and their consent, the state will fall of its own accord. The voluntary statement which George and Wendy and I formulated at the very initiation of the voluntarists puts it this, thusly, and I'll read this. Voluntarists are advocates of non-political and non-violent strategies to achieve a free society. We reject electoral politics in theory and in, and in practice as incompatible with libertarian principles. Governments must cloak their actions in an aura of moral legitimacy in order to sustain their power. And political methods invariably strengthen that legitimacy. Voluntarists seek instead to delegitimize the state through education, and we advocate withdrawal of the cooperation and tacit consent on which state power ultimately depends. Nine, and this is my last point, closing in here, uh, graphically displayed, this, my description would encompass a large circle labeled libertarians. And then within that circle of libertarians, there would be a smaller circle labeled anarchists. And within the anarchist circle would be yet a smaller circle labeled voluntarists for those anarchists who reject electoral politics and embrace peaceful change. I'd like to conclude this part of my talk by quoting from H.L. Mencken, who wrote th this statement in the forum in September 1930. And I quote Mencken here. I believe, Mencken said, that all government is evil and that all government must make war upon liberty and that the democratic form is at least as bad as any of the other forms. But the whole thing may, after all, be put very simply. I believe it is better to tell the truth than lie. I believe it is better to be a free man than to be a slave. And I believe it is better to, the, to know than to be ignorant. And that pretty much summarizes up my sentiments on being a voluntarist. Now I'd like to just mention uh, some of the highlight articles that are in the ebook. Call to them to your attention. Uh, one of the introductory articles is, called, is titled "The Fundamentals of Voluntarism," and this uh, was done 
very early on in the formation of the voluntarists. And if you're looking for a sort of a, a slightly longer uh, description of voluntarism, we'll just what I just went through my what voluntarism means to me, I'd suggest you look at this. Here, I uh, this is an, a brochure that I put together primarily with George and Wendy's help. And I label uh, seven arguments in favor of voluntarism. Uh, the epistemological argument, mainly that you can't shoot a truth. That uh, if you rely on the truth, that that is your best strategy. And then the economic argument, based on Austrian economics, that people enter into exchanges in order to better themselves. And thousands and thousands of people do that every day will probably result in an improved standard of living for most of those people. The moral argument that we can't force our ideas of good on other people, nor do we want them to force their ideas of good on us. The natural law argument that common sense and reason override government legislation. Uh, government legislation cannot make two and two equal something other than four. There has to be, even behind government legislation, some rationale. The uh, means and end argument for voluntarism uh, is epitomized by a saying that we picked up from Gandhi that if one takes care of the means, the end will take care of itself. This is a very uh, significant way of, you might say, looking at life or approaching any kind of uh, strategic concern. We only have the means at the current, the means at hand currently, and it is that which directs us towards the end. So if we don't use appropriate means, there's no chance of ever arriving at the right end. Uh, the consistency argument ties in with this means and end insight that the means must be consistent with the end sought. And uh, finally, the last point in this Fundamentals of Voluntarism deals with integrity, self-control, and corruption. Voluntarists realize that they alone direct their own actions and that they are self-responsible. And they know that political power corrupts and that they wish to distance themselves from that corruption. One of my uh, favorite all-time artists in the ebook is has a lengthy title, which which reads "Thinkers and Groups of Individuals Who Have Contributed Significant Ideas or Major Written Materials to the Radical Libertarian Tradition." This is a uh, chronological survey, which starts with uh, 1 Samuel of the Old Testament Bible and describes uh, various thinkers and schools of thought that have contributed to the libertarian tradition and the voluntarist heritage. Uh, it ends with uh, mentioning Roth Murray Rothbard, Ayn Rand, Bob Lefebvre, Andrew Galambos, and others. Another good introductory article and article which will give you a historical perspective on voluntarism uh, is an article titled On the History of the Word Voluntarism. It uh, goes back somewhat lexicographically uh, and looks how voluntarism has been used both in uh, arguments for religious freedom, separation of church and state, as well as uh, attacks or criticisms of government taxation. Another significant article is one that I titled The Territorial Assumption, Rationale for Conquest. <clears throat> this is an article that uh, starts out by agreeing with a statement that Robert Nozick wrote in his book, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, when he says 
at right at the very beginning of his book that the fundamental question of political philosophy is should there be any state at all? In other words, we don't want to assume that we need a state and then argue over various details. But the first question that needs to be addressed, addressed is should there be a government? Should there be a state? So in this article that I wrote using that kind of as a springboard, I list a number of justificatory questions that people who support the state need to answer. The first is the question of protection. Why is a monopolistic system of protection to be preferred to a voluntary system? And even if you agree that some government is necessary, how do you justify what form it takes? As Mencken said, the democratic form is at least as bad as every other form. The point is, they're all bad. Uh, then you have the question of boundaries. If political authority should exist, how are people and territories to be bounded? In other words, is there any logical basis for saying that one country stops here and another country starts there? There really isn't. Then there's the question of the limits of jurisdiction. If political authority, if political authority should exist, what over what matters does it have jurisdiction and why? And what and over what matters does it not have jurisdiction? And then finally there's the question of taxation. As I said today to somebody I was having a conversation with, to me, in a very, on a very fundamental, in a very fundamental sense, taxation is stealing. So, you know, if you have a government, how should it be funded? Can it be funded in a way so that it is not stealing? And if you grant the government access to some revenue in some form, how are the purse strings to be controlled? Another one of my favorite articles is the criminal metaphor in the libertarian tradition. Uh, this picks up on Lysander Spooner and quite another, quite a number of other libertarians who described government as organized by gangs of banditti, pirates, highwaymen, and robbers. In the article, The Case Against Democracy, I quote Robert Nisbet, who says, with all respect to differences on types of government, there is not in strict theory any difference between the powers available to the democratic and to the totalitarian state. And of course that's a anarchist uh, insight into the nature of government. There's quite a few articles in the ebook on uh, historical, the historical aspects of voluntarism. And I'll just very briefly mention them. One is called The Noiseless Revolution, in which I look at the history of time zones in the United States, which were not started or inaugurated by government, but rather through the railroads to set up uh, time zones in order to establish uh, or rationalize their schedules. In the article Hard Money in the Voluntarist Tradition, I look at the fact that uh, during the gold rush in California and later in Colorado and even in, in the southeast part of the United States before the Civil War, there actually was private gold coinage. And it actually existed. You can, numismatic collectors today can find those coins. There's an article on voluntarism and the evolution of the oil industry. The oil industry is probably uh, only 150 years old, and it certainly wasn't created by the government. It was created by entrepreneurs in the oil fields in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's articles on uh, voluntarism and uh, educational statism that deals with uh, government-run education in, in the United States and how it evolved. 
and there's a lengthy article on volunteerism and arbitration. And then I just mentioned the last two articles of significance. One is titled A Monopoly on the Means of Identification, the Evolution of Compulsory Birth and Death Certificates in the United States. Uh, this article was written in conjunction with a book that Wendy and I put together titled uh, National Identification Essays in Opposition that was published a few years ago. Uh, the article looks at how uh, birth certificates and death certificates were used by state and federal governments to control, number, and track their people. And then the, the last article in this uh, series is the precursor of national identification cards in the United States, driver's licenses, and vehicle registration in historic perspective. Uh, obviously, when people were riding horses and had horse and buggies and wagons, there were no driver's licenses. And I uh, uh, researched and found some interesting stories about people back in the early 1900s, 1920s, uh, getting the first licenses, how the, the state governments got involved in this, and how driver's licenses have, in effect, evolved into national ID today. Uh, since we have a little time left, I'd like to return to uh, talking about my personal roots as a voluntarist a little bit more in depth. So how did I become a, a libertarian and then a voluntarist? What were some of the major uh, influences on my intellectual development? Probably the two most important thing, uh, events occurred during the summer of 1963 when I was 15. First, I read an editorial in the Wall Street Journal that commented on Ludwig von Mises and free market economics. Uh, I grew up in a family where we owned family businesses. And uh, my father was, I guess you would describe, conservative, free market oriented. So this reference to von Mises got me started. And then secondly, that same summer, don't ask me how or why, but my mother gave me a copy of Atlas Shrugged to Read. When I found that some of von Mises' books had been published by the uh, Foundation for Economic Education, <clears throat> I got hooked on understanding capitalism, limited government, and Austrian economics. Uh, it took a few years, but by 1970, I had read uh, some of Murray Rothbard's works, and I had found Morris and Linda Tannehill's book, The Market for Liberty. Uh, that was sort of the turning point in my life then that convinced me that government was as unnecessary as any other evil, as Morris had put it. In 1971, uh, I discovered uh, Lysander Spooner and uh, brought the six-volume set of his collected works, which had been published. And that really kind of got me hooked again. Uh, during the mid-1970s, I published a number of articles in Reason, on Spooner, on Thoreau, on Gustave de Molinari, and on uh, private one titled Private California Gold that dealt with the uh, hard money tradition and volu voluntarist tradition. I'll just briefly comment on what Matt said about discovering vices are not crimes. In uh, Liberty, which was a publication that was printed by Benjamin Tucker uh, during the late 1880s through the 1890s and the early 1900s, there was an obituary uh, of Spooner's death. I read it avidly, obviously, with my interest in Spooner. And Tucker mentioned in the obituary that there was an anonymous article that Spooner had written on vices are not crimes that was in a book by a man named D.O. Lewis on temperance. So I did a little bit of research and digging and eventually found that book. And there is a chapter in it 
uh, which obviously was written by Spooner, titled Vices Are Not Crimes. And uh, it was a, then republished as a monograph. It can be found on the, uh, on the Voluntaria site. It can be found on uh, Spooner.org. And I'm sure it's gotten wide distribution. So anyhow, the rest, you might say, is simply history from the late 1970s. Now, before I close, I would like to mention that on the Voluntaria site, we have a whole section uh, devoted to articles around the, the subject of how I became a voluntarius. There's probably at least 20 or more articles written by various people, some lengthy, some are just short paragraphs on how they were influenced and became voluntarius. So anyone listening tonight is welcome to look at those, obviously, but also invited to write their own story and uh, send it to me. Uh, the email address is just editor at voluntarius.com. So again, I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time to be with us tonight. And if there are any questions, I'll do my best to answer them if I can. text in the questions tab to the right, or if you'd like to come on video and ask a question, uh, you can click video chatting in the upper right, and then click start your webcam, and I should be able to bring you on screen. All right, perfect. I'll bring it up. In, I'll bring it up. In. Uh, Henry says, the founder of the original voluntarism, Oberyn Herbert, supported both voting and semantic debate over whether the debate over whether taxes or not, of course. So voluntarism, the viewpoints of your position are opposition to in contrast to minarchists, and voting in contrast to even some anarchists who, who agree with the voting can be the evidence of that. All right, it's a little bit hard to grasp the entire question, but I'll do my best uh, to grapple with it. All right, uh, first of all, if you read the article on the history of the word voluntarism, Auburn Herbert was not the first one to use it. Uh, George actually picked it up after he researched an article on the opponents of government education in England during the 1840s. They used, specifically used the term voluntarist. Uh, Henry is definitely perceptive in uh, questioning me about Herbert. And actually, I thought <coughs> when I you know, kind of generalized that somebody might raise that issue. Uh, Herbert, and we don't read, you know, there's a lot written about Herbert that you can find, but in my opinion, he was in favor of voluntary taxation. And although he had been a member of parliament, he realized that there was lots of problems in a political approach. So to, to try to answer one part of the question, the term voluntarist had not been used in the late 20th century to any great extent. It had a, a rich history as far as George and Wendy and I were concerned. And it served as a very uh, appealing label to differentiate ourselves from those in the Libertarian Party who were, for lack of a better identification, uh, anarchists who believed in an electoral strategy. Hopefully that answers most of the points. Actually, the next question is from me. Um, now, you said in uh, one of the essays in the Voluntarist uh, 
He said, hopefully, if someone in the future finds copies of the Voluntarist newsletter or the anthology that I'm proposing to publish, they will help to rekindle, rediscover, or elaborate the ideal of a totally free market society. One doesn't need to be a pessimist to see that those ideas might one day disappear. Even in our time, only a small part of the population embraces libertarian ideas. And only a small number of libertarian teams consider the libertarian People who reject voting and who legitimacy is the state. Even the individualism of the second century of American history is in danger of being obliterated by a state propaganda. And the local the volunteers will play some part in preserving a record of those times in history when men were free to act without state interference and were self confident enough to know that the state possesses no magical powers. Now, that's a really, really interesting thing to look back on. Um, I think it was. Uh, written in uh, 1998, now that uh, libertarianism has exploded over the last few years. Are you still uh, pessimistic as to the outlook for liberty in the short run? In the short run? That's somewhat difficult to answer. Uh, you know, I always try to look on the bright side of things, but we have a, uh, a friend that who wouldn't probably even describe himself as a libertarian, but he's a natural born free market person. Uh, and the expression is the noose is tightening. Uh, anybody who at least is active in the, I guess you'd say the business world, uh, would, would feel the noose tightening. Anything from the uh, FACTA laws that the IRS is trying to get about foreign accounts to all the myriad bureaucracy that we have. So that's kind of one response on one level. But on another level, obviously, the internet has uh, helped spread the, the libertarian message and the voluntarist message. So, you know, I guess all we can say is, the, you know, it's up to history to, to let us know how things end up. I would mention, just in perspective, though, that I always in the back of my mind, I suppose, is Ayn Rand's anthem, in which you know the word "I" had disappeared, and the whole freedom philosophy was gone, and then somewhat rekindled. So, I all I can say is I think everybody has. To Everybody that's libertarian oriented, voluntarist oriented, has to to do the the best that they can, both living the voluntarist philosophy and promoting the ideas. And as the, I said before, you take care of the means, the end will take care of itself. And wherever that ends us, that's that's the best we can do. Um. All right, uh, Johnny uh, Back Halberg asks, Carl, I don't know much about your business background, but I'm curious about any thoughts about the best way for someone who agrees with your ideas to make a good living. Do all voluntarists take a vow of poverty? No, not certainly not to my knowledge. <laughs> I, you know, that's a, a very difficult question as to how to answer, and it's a, and a different answer for each person, certainly. You know, some people might try to live below the poverty level to avoid involvement with government taxation. Others might be fortunate enough to have, you know, a wealthy wife, a wealthy aunt, or whatever. And, you know, others might, like, to the uh, people in the tax protest movement might just to be above board and challenge the IRS. So it's again, it's everybody is in different circumstances and has to make best of their own situation. I think, uh, mentioned, uh, Anthem in your last answer because. I read that passage. That's exactly what came to mind for me. Now, in, in thinking about uh, 
those most influential uh, essays and books that that uh, that you might recommend? Like, what's one essay and one book that you would say is indispensable for uh, any voluntarist's reading? That's a good question. <laughs> Let me just think a second. The uh, Matt, I'm just trying to grasp with your question, grapple with your question a minute. Uh, you're talking about somebody that's on their way to voluntarism, somebody that's a libertarian, or what exactly? Or uh, you want me to answer that answer? Let me listen a little, listen a little more carefully. Uh, I would say for someone who is has already rejected the legitimacy of this state in something uh, literature wise to fortify you in that position and really provide the, the the foundations for that position what's the best I know it's hard to choose just one but what's the best essay and the best book That requires some thought for me to answer, <laughs> so I'm going to just have to pass, really. I mean, on the voluntary site, for example, there's a section uh, titled Bibliography. There's a short list and a long list, uh, so I would, anybody is interested, I would say look there and they'll get some good ideas. You know, I mean, I cut my eye teeth on a lot of what Murray Rothbard wrote, but he supported the Libertarian Party for much of his, you know, latter life. But uh, there's a lot of voluntarist meat, you might say, in what Murray wrote. You just have to kind of separate it from his support of electoral politics. Well, I've a link to the voluntarist.com website in the chat for users if anyone wants to check it out. Also, definitely check out the Essential Voluntarist, which is free for members on liberty.me. And uh, thanks everyone for your questions, and thank you, Carl, for coming and speaking to us. Thank you, Matt. Everyone, have a great everyone. night and take care. Nine point, short nine point discussion about what voluntarism means to me. That's kind of, after we get into that, and give you a basis for understanding my perspective on voluntarism. And then in the third part of my talk, I'd like to mention some of the highlights and most important articles, the articles that I find most uh, appealing to me in the ebook. And then uh, finally, I'd like to return to a little more in-depth talk of how I actually became a voluntarist. And then if we have some time at the end, uh, I'll be open for questions, do my best to answer them. So the background of the voluntarist per se actually began in uh, early 1982 in George Smith's apartment in Los Angeles, California. Uh, George Smith and Wendy McElroy and I had made uh, contact through some libertarian conferences earlier that year and in the preceding year. George was concerned that some of the free market uh, anarchists were getting involved in the Libertarian Party, too. It was also about this same time that I made the acquaintance of Bob Lefebvre, and uh, he was very supportive of the idea behind the voluntarists. And it was through Bob that I actually met my wife, uh, Julie, at Freedom School in South Carolina. George and Wendy and I cooperated in publishing the Voluntarius Noodles letter for a number of years, but uh, eventually their interest in it uh, dwindled, and I continued on studying, researching, writing on voluntarism 
newsletter. In a sense, used it as my personal form, as one of my outlets. In 2000, after I had completed uh, the first hundred issues of the newsletter, uh, Fox and Wilkes, a division of laissez-faire books, published the first anthology, the first voluntarist anthology, which is titled "I Must Speak Out." Uh, so that covered the first hundred issues. Uh, the new ebook uh, covers probably another fifty issues, and at the present time, I'm Hi everyone, and thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we are here tonight with Carl Watner, the author of the Essential Voluntarist. Well, he's the he published and edited uh, the Voluntarist newsletter since uh, 1982, and we're here celebrating the release for Liberty Me members of the Essential Voluntarist, which is a, a fabulous collection of essays. Now, Carl is an author, a uh, a a historian of libertarian studies and a voluntarist himself. He's written for Reason Magazine, Libertarian Forum, and the, Journey, the Journal of Libertarian Studies. And one of my favorite things uh, about Carl is that he has uh, he found the Vices Are Not Crimes essay by Lysander Spooner. Apparently, I, that's one of my favorite essays, and I'm so glad he brought it to light. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Carl Wattner. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight, Matt. Thanks for your introduction. I'm grateful to the management and sponsors of Liberty Me for publishing this ebook and for giving me an opportunity to speak tonight. I'm grateful to Wendy McElroy uh, for being the editor of this anthology of my articles. I'm grateful to my wife and family for their support. I'm also uh, thankful to David, who is the webmaster of a voluntary site for all the work that he does to make up on the tour. And as an aside, I just like to mention that most of the articles that I mentioned in that list, besides being in the ebook, will be some I mentioned that aren't in the ebook, can be found on the voluntary site, www.voluntarius.com. And if anybody wishes to communicate with me, they can use the contact uh, us for on the voluntary site to reach me. Briefly, briefly tonight, I'd like to talk, uh, organize my talk into four sections. Uh, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the personal events in my own life uh, that led to the formation of the voluntarists. And then, in uh, preparation for my talk tonight, I prepared a non and he saw that as being inconsistent with their advocacy of anarchism, of doing away with the state. George had already written a uh, lengthy article titled Party Dialogue, with a uh, conversation between a Libertarian Party supporter and a uh, anti-libertarian or anti-electoral or voluntarist about the pros and cons of libertarians libertarian involved in electoral politics. Uh, that particular article was published by Sam Konkin originally and it can be found on the voluntary site today. So George and Wendy and I at the time and over a, a few months time decided that we needed a, vo a vocal point to espouse new strategies and to present the oppositional ideas as to the uh, Libertarian Party. At that point, it was decided that a, a newsletter would be appropriate, be an appropriate form, and we published the first issue, as Matt said, of the Voluntarist in 1982. 